How's it going folks? Welcome back to another discussion video. Now let's get into it. The Rough Riders, the Battle of Manila, the explosion of the USS Maine, and the Battle of San Juan Hill. The Spanish-American War endures in America's history as the splendid little war. The war saw the death of Spain's storied empire and the rise of a new American empire. The war went on to define the history of both nations in the decades that followed. While the United States had only been growing more powerful during the 1800s, Spain had been weakening throughout the same century due to political instability and an unwillingness to modernize their nation. The Spanish-American War was hardly a war at all. The United States dominated Spain throughout the war, taking Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Mariana Islands, and the Philippines from Spain and claiming these territories for themselves. For generations, the United States had coveted the island of Cuba, especially ownership of its lucrative sugar industry. Although the United States had offered to buy Cuba from Spain several times, they were rebuffed by the Spanish constantly, as Cuba was one of the few colonies Spain still retained after most of their American colonies had won their independence. However, many Cubans opposed Spanish rule, and the Cuban independence movement had advocated for independence from Spain for decades. The desire for Cuban independence rose to a fever pitch in the 1890s when Cuban poet José Martí became the figurehead of the independence movement until he was killed in action fighting the Spanish in 1895 following the outbreak of the Cuban War of Independence. After many years of attempting to peacefully acquire Cuba, the United States finally got an opportunity to take the island by force in 1898. On February 15, 1898, an American naval vessel, the USS Maine, was docked in the harbor of the Cuban colonial capital, Havana, sent there to protect U.S. business interests as Cuban independence activists had launched a full-scale war of independence against Spain. On that day in February, the USS Maine exploded in Havana Harbor, killing 268 American sailors. Immediately, war hawks in the American government and military blamed the explosion on Spain, their claims amplified by the American media to justify a war with Spain claiming the Spanish had purposefully sunk the USS Maine using a mine or torpedo. The Spanish government disagreed. The Spanish investigators claimed that the explosion had been caused by spontaneous combustion of the coal storage area on board the Maine, which was later corroborated by American investigations in 1974 and 1998. Although the ship's destruction had been an accident, the United States used the tragedy as Casas Belli to wage war against Spain supported by a population driven into a frenzy against Spain by the media. Furthering the pro-war movement was a long-standing sympathy towards the Cuban independence movement by the United States and a desire by American sugar companies to acquire Cuba's lucrative sugar industry. And on April 21, 1898, the United States launched a war against Spain, claiming their cause to be the liberation of Cuba, but in reality, the mission was to take all of Spain's colonies for the United States. Soon enough, American forces had occupied the Spanish colonies of Cuba, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, where the U.S. arrived and assisted the Philippine independence movement against the Spanish, only to turn against the independence fighters once Spain had been defeated. The conflict saw the United States expand into Asia for the first time, as well as acquire new colonies in Latin America. Conversely, the conflict also saw the dying Spanish Empire lose the last of its colonial holdings and be humiliated on the international stage. The loss of Spain's colonies triggered a nationwide crisis and fury by the Spanish people at their government's incompetence. The American victory in the war only bolstered patriotism nationwide in the United States and saw other nations begin to recognize America's growing status as an international power. The Mariana Island of Guam and the island of Puerto Rico are still U.S. territories to this day. The Philippines, after a brutal war against the United States, was subdued by the American military and only gained independence on the 4th of July, 1946. Cuba was granted de jure independence in 1902, but remained a client state of the United States racked by political instability and corruption, until a communist revolution in 1959 saw Cuba break away from the United States under the dictatorship of Fidel Castro. The splendid little war saw Spain's colonies become American, but what if it had never happened? Let's find out. Our point of divergence is May 19, 1895. It was on this day in our timeline that one of the brightest political leaders of the Cuban independence movement, José Martí, was killed by Spain in the Battle of Los Rios. During this battle, Martí made a grave error in judgment and commenced a two-man cavalry charge against Spanish forces during the battle, 
and when he was spotted, he was immediately killed by Spanish soldiers. In an alternate timeline, however, let's say that Jose Marti decides not to do the cavalry charge, and thus survives the Battle of Dos Rios, and retreats with his soldiers as the Cuban rebels still lose the battle as they did in our timeline, although Jose Marti is still alive. Following the defeat at Dos Rios, Jose Marti continues as a charismatic leader within the Cuban independence movement. Shortly after escaping the Battle of Dos Rios, Marti travels to the United States, where he was already very popular, and embarks on a major speaking tour, which ends with Marti securing a large amount of private funding for the Cuban rebellion. Upon his return to Cuba, Marti and other rebel leaders, now armed with weapons and funds from America, coordinate an escalation of the rebellion with Marti himself continuing as the movement's figurehead. Because of these better circumstances, many leaders of the independence movement, like Antonio Maceo Grajales, survived their skirmishes with the Spanish due to their newly acquired American weapons and a better organized intelligence service established by Martí to get intel on the movement of Spanish troops. Martí, Maceo, along with the famed rebel Generalísimo Máximo Gómez, worked together to free Cuba from the Spanish with popular support from many Cubans and strong American backing. Together, the three men managed to create an effective fighting force, and by May 1st, 1897, the Cuban rebels had effectively pushed the Spanish out of all but a few cities across the island. Spanish Prime Minister Parajedes Mateo Sagasta reluctantly agrees to peace talks with the Cuban rebels, and on May 20th, 1897, Cuba is granted independence from Spain. Mass protests break out in the Spanish capital of Madrid as Spanish troops withdraw from Cuba. Some are sent home. Some are sent to be stationed in Puerto Rico, but most are redirected to the Philippines, where another independence movement is looking to topple Spanish rule. Meanwhile, in Cuba, José Martí becomes a national hero and proclaims the creation of the provisional government of the Republic of Cuba before a jubilant crowd in the capital of Havana. By 1898, there is no reason for the United States to send the USS Maine to Havana, and thus it never explodes in Havana Harbor. President José Martí guides Cuba through the years immediately following independence, and while he maintains a close and friendly relationship with the United States, he utilizes his political capital and positive image in the U.S. to prevent any attempts by U.S. big business to dominate Cuba and its economy. In 1900, the provisional government ends when José Martí and Antonio Maceo Grajales both win full terms as president and vice president of Cuba, respectively. José Martí goes on to rule the island nation of Cuba until 1908, when, after two terms in office, he leaves in a peaceful transfer of power to be succeeded by Vice President Maceo Grajales. Martí's lasting legacy within Cuba is a vibrant democracy and a good relationship with the United States. As he prepares to depart Havana on his last day in office, Martí is met by cheering crowds celebrating the first president of the Republic of Cuba. For the nation of Cuba, the legacy of a world without a Spanish-American war is a sovereign island nation with a strong tradition of democracy, allied with the United States, but not subservient to it. Without the explosion of the USS Maine, the United States is left without a Casas belly to invade Cuba, and thus the Spanish-American War never occurs. An important issue to be kept in mind during this period is that, in both timelines, current U.S. President William McKinley was very hesitant to wage war against Spain, as he himself suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder stemming from his service in the U.S. Civil War nearly 40 years before. He only declared war when public opinion of him not doing so turned sharply against him. Without the Spanish in Cuba, under McKinley, the United States never wages war. Although the United States does not expand its territory in a splendid little war, the timeline does not change all too much for the nation. In 1898, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, is eyed as a prime candidate for governor of New York by the Republican Party due to his progressivism and natural charisma. Roosevelt narrowly wins the 1898 New York gubernatorial election and goes on to become a popular politician defined by his charisma and willingness to stand up to corporations and political machines in an era that was defined by them. Roosevelt is nominated to be vice president in the 1900 Republican National Convention alongside President McKinley and the two go on to win the 1900 election against Democratic candidate William Jennings Bryan. Six months into his second term, McKinley is assassinated, leaving Roosevelt to assume the office of the president. Going forward, America's history is all but identical to our own, just without any wars in the Philippines or Cuba. As Cuba and the United States both celebrate peace and prosperity going into the 20th century, the same cannot be said for the Philippines. After losing Cuba, 
anger, and humiliation grip the people of Spain, who remained resolute that the Philippines will not escape their grasp as Cuba did. Spanish troops stationed in Cuba are mainly redeployed to the Philippines after Cuban independence and inflict heavy losses on the Filipino independence fighters. Concurrent with their massive troop surge in the Philippines, Spain works to censor information regarding their failures across Spain and her colonies. However, due to the distance between the Philippines and Spain, resupplying and reinforcing the Spanish military in the Philippines is difficult at times, which keeps the fledgling Philippine independence movement from being completely crushed. As losses mount and many leaders die, a young rebel named Emilio Aguinaldo emerges as the undisputed leader of the Philippine independence movement. The Filipino War of Independence soon devolves into a bloody slog between the Spanish and Aguinaldo's forces. Atrocities are frequently committed by the Spanish, and Aguinaldo answers in kind. As the Spanish intensify their efforts to crush the Filipino rebels, their leader, Aguinaldo, reaches out to neighboring powers for support. While China is too weak to help, the Empire of Japan accepts Aguinaldo's overtures and begins to supply financial and military aid to the Filipino rebels, but stops short of a full military intervention. Years pass. As word of the horrors of the war in the Philippines makes its way back to Spain along with countless dead and injured soldiers beginning to return home, public support for the war in the Philippines begins to decrease with many wishing to simply focus on the other islands of the Spanish Pacific and Puerto Rico, both of which are suffering from a lack of resources due to the war in the Philippines. The Spanish government decides to cut its losses and begins peace talks with Aguinaldo's representatives in 1904. After years of bloodshed, Aguinaldo emerges victorious. On January 22, 1905, the last Spanish troops leave Manila as Aguinaldo proclaims the birth of the state of the Philippines. Aguinaldo himself, embittered after so many years of bloodshed, assumes dictatorial powers via the proclamation of a state of emergency to guide the Philippines in the years immediately following the end of the War of Independence. Although the state of emergency is due to end in 10 years, Aguinaldo decides to remain in office as dictator of the Philippines indefinitely convinced that only he can shepherd the nation after the horrors of the war. Starting in 1920, Aguinaldo's government begins a strong diplomatic partnership with the Empire of Japan, which further down the road will have major consequences. For the nation of the Philippines, the legacy of a world without the Spanish-American War is one of expedited independence, albeit at a tremendous human cost. The Philippines is defined by Aguinaldo's strong leadership that pervades nearly every facet of society, its national identity anchored to a burgeoning cult of personality that begins to emerge around the young leader in the years immediately following independence. Furthermore, the Philippine economy is defined by Japanese investment in the war-torn nation, which is what allows the islands to recover after the war against the Spanish. Beginning in 1905, the Spanish Empire enters a period of reconstruction and introspection, much as it did in 1898 in our timeline. The loss of Cuba and the Philippines is humiliating in both timelines, but in this alternate timeline, the Spanish ego is even further bruised by the fact that they were not defeated by a superior military power, but by peasant soldiers. Prime Minister Mateo Sagasta is forced to resign in disgrace in 1905, in the aftermath of what many term El Disastre, or the disaster, in reference to Spain's back-to-back -back losses in Cuba and the Philippines. Following Spain's calamitous defeat in the Pacific, the United States, eager to gain a foothold in the Pacific Islands and East Asia, successfully purchases the Marshall Islands from the German Empire, which expands its influence in the region beyond Hawaii and occupies the role Guam and the Philippines did for the United States in our timeline. When war breaks out in 1914, Spain remains neutral in the First World War, while it attempts to combat its losses in the Caribbean and Pacific with expansion into Morocco, which is still successful in this alternate timeline. Alongside Morocco, the Spanish Sahara and Spanish Guinea are also unaffected by the drastic changes altering other places in this alternate timeline. Essentially, World War I follows the same trajectory as in our timeline. Aside from expansion into Africa, Spain also embarks on a series of reforms and new programs to shore up support and consolidate power in its remaining colonies. Puerto Rico is soon flooded with Spanish troops, with the government of Spain paranoid of the growing Puerto Rican nationalist movement inspired by similar movements in Cuba and the Philippines, which aims to foment a rebellion against Spain on the island. On January 1, 1911, General Miguel Primo de Rivera, a veteran of the Cuban, Philippine, and Melian Wars, is installed by King Alfonso of Spain as the new governor of Puerto Rico, in an effort to modernize Puerto Rico's infrastructure and economy, as well as eliminate the Puerto Rican independence movement. 
Lima Madre Rivera declares martial law across Puerto Rico and gets to work on modernizing the island to ensure Puerto Rico remains in Spanish hands. On January 11, 1911, just 10 days after Primo de Rivera took office, Puerto Rican independence activists attempt to incite a rebellion in the colonial capital of San Juan, hoping to exploit the government's weakness during the period of transition. However, Primo de Rivera was not to be caught off guard and unleashes the colonial military forces across San Juan, who engage in wanton killing and violence throughout any areas of the city with a rebel presence. 800 people die in what is later termed as La Masacre del 1-11-11, or the 1-11-11 Massacre. From 1911 until his departure in 1919, Primo de Rivera's dictatorship forcefully modernizes the island of Puerto Rico and builds up its defenses to ensure the Spanish military will be able to combat any insurgency or foreign incursion. The native Puerto Ricans are heavily oppressed under the Primo de Rivera dictatorship, and any protests or signs of dissent are harshly cracked down upon. Thousands of Puerto Ricans are murdered or worked to death by the Primo de Rivera dictatorship in what is later remembered as the darkest chapter in the island's history. Because of Governor Primo de Rivera's violent and authoritarian rule, he does ultimately succeed in his goals for Puerto Rico. Primo de Rivera successfully modernizes the island's infrastructure and economy, bolsters its defenses, and decimates the local independence movement, termed El Movimiento Boricua. For the island of Puerto Rico, the legacy of a world without the Spanish-American War is a world where Puerto Rico is an inalienable part of Spain, where the Spanish identity of the Puerto Rican people is reiterated at every turn, and where nationalist sentiments are ruthlessly suppressed by Spain, much like they were by the United States in our timeline. While Primo de Rivera had succeeded in bringing order to Puerto Rico, he is recalled to Spain in 1919, as the situation on the peninsula has deteriorated rapidly. In the aftermath of El Disastre, Spain has been plagued by political instability from the rise of anarchism and communism in many of its newly industrialized cities, as well as regional separatism in the Basque Country and Catalonia. Clashes between the beleaguered Spanish military and left-wing forces frequently break out across the country. The violent confrontations are driven by the military sense of humiliation following El Disastre, as well as by the left-wing forces' desire to have better working conditions, and in the case of Basque and Catalonian separatists, self-governance. In 1919, after seeing Primo de Rivera's success in quelling dissent across Puerto Rico, the King of Spain, Alfonso, recalls Primo de Rivera to the mainland and immediately puts him in command of military forces currently combating a communist revolt in the region of Valencia. Under Primo de Rivera's brutal and charismatic leadership, the military manages to crush the Valencian revolt of 1919, the aftermath of which sees Spain's military begin to idolize Primo de Rivera. Frustrated that Spain's government since El Disastre has been so weak as to allow communists and separatists to run amok in Spain's cities, in the summer of 1919, King Alfonso soon gathers the most respected military leaders of Spain, led by Primo de Rivera, and instructs them to crush the weak democratic government and replace it with a dictatorship led by Primo de Rivera. On September 13, 1919, General Primo de Rivera launches a coup against Spain's democratic government which sees the military seize many key cities and much of the country put under martial law as armed soldiers patrol the streets. When the government appeals to King Alfonso for help, he shocks them by instead appointing Primo de Rivera as Spain's new prime minister. Primo de Rivera goes on to dissolve the government by force and becomes the military dictator of Spain. As Primo de Rivera consolidates his power through appeals to a Spanish public tired of social unrest, he launches various initiatives similar to what he'd accomplished in Puerto Rico. Primo de Rivera's main focus is modernizing Spain's infrastructure, including electrical grids, sewage, and roads, through public works projects, beginning in 1921. Primo de Rivera initially accomplishes these projects through increased taxes on the rich, but is forced to change funding strategies by 1923, when increasing backlash from the Spanish elite threatens his hold on power, and moving forward, he funds his ambitious projects with foreign loans. Alongside the modernization of Spain's infrastructure, Primo de Rivera also refocuses the military on rebuilding and modernizing Spain's outdated and weak navy. Primo de Rivera's stated reason for this is the need to better connect Spain to its Pacific colonies. Migration, trade, and cultural ties between Spain and the Spanish Pacific had only been growing since the completion of the Panama Canal in 1914. 
Since the completion of the Panama Canal significantly decreased the time it took to travel between the two regions, more and more Spaniards found themselves immigrating to the island chains of the Marianas and Carolines. With increased migration came the arrival of modern infrastructure in the region. Unlike in our timeline, where Spain sold the Northern Marianas and Caroline Islands to Germany and lost Guam to the U.S. after the Spanish-American War, in this timeline they retain all these islands. Politically, Spain reorganizes the colonial government in the Pacific, moving the seat of power from its former location of Manila, lost in the Philippine Independence War, to a new colonial capital in the city of Agaña, on the island of Guahan, which is what Guam is called in this timeline. Guahan becomes the political and social center of the Spanish Pacific. Aside from expansion and settlement in the Mariana Islands of Saipan, Dinian, Sarpana, and Guahan, Spanish immigrants also spread out to the Caroline Islands. Primo de Rivera also ensures a constant military presence across every inhabited island, forever haunted by the loss of the Philippines. For the Mariana and Caroline Islands, the legacy of a world without the Spanish-American War is one of increased investment in their communities, but also increased immigration and integration with the Spanish-speaking world. Because of the increased ties with Spain, Spanish becomes the lingua franca in the Marianas and Caroline Islands, and while each island retains its indigenous languages, most islands in the Spanish Pacific speak Spanish as a second language, which encourages greater unity between the islands. However, by 1929, Rimo de Rivera's risky use of foreign loans causes an economic disaster, as the global economy crashes and the Great Depression begins. Facing mounting pressure to leave office, a loss of royal and military support, and civil unrest, Primo de Rivera resigns in disgrace on March 16, 1930, leaving behind a complicated legacy. Under his rule, the Caroline and Mariana Islands saw rapid development as well as a population boom. Puerto Rico was brutalized and fortified, and Spain itself underwent a period of development that changed the nation forever, only to see their progress become in danger when Primo de Rivera's extensive loans resulted in an economic depression. Following the end of the Primo de Rivera dictatorship, an interim government maintained order across the empire and arranged to hold an election in Spain for the first time in years. The main parties standing in the general election were the monarchist and republican coalitions, and the election was widely viewed as a referendum on King Alfonso himself. The majority of Spain, dissatisfied with King Alfonso's rule and explicit endorsement of Primo de Rivera's dictatorship, overwhelmingly favors the Spanish republican coalition in the election, and on April 12, 1931, it becomes apparent that the Republicans have crushed the monarchists in a landslide victory. Following the election results, King Alfonso flees to Italy as a republic is proclaimed in Spain in 1931. Soon after the election, a republican government formally seizes power. However, almost immediately, it is beset by problems stemming from infighting. The republican coalition was composed of several distinct groups, including the center-left republicans, left-wing socialists, and far-left communists and anarchists, alongside regional separatist movements within Catalonia and the Basque Country. With numerous visions of the future competing for prominence, the new Republican government struggles to function. Even worse, societal tensions flare as right-wing traditionalists and militias clash with emboldened anarchists and communists across Spain. Among the extreme left of the Republican coalition, some begin to commit acts of violence against religious clergy, inciting fury amongst traditionalist Catholic Spaniards. On October 29, 1933, just as in our timeline, José Antonio Primo de Rivera, son of General Miguel Primo de Rivera, founds the Spanish Falange Movement, influenced by German and Italian fascism and Spanish traditionalism. As the Spanish Republic's left-wing government continues to falter from political infighting, Many begin to view the Republic as a weak institution beholden to communists and anarchists. This leads the Flanges movement's numbers to rapidly increase, along with the ideology spreading rapidly through the Spanish military. In early 1936, José Antonio Primo de Rivera, founding father of the Flanges movement, is arrested and shot by Republican authorities, turning the ideologue into a martyr for the fascist cause. The Republic, whose leadership had long been consumed by inter-party chaos, struggles to maintain order following the death of Primo de Rivera. The left-wing Popular Front coalition barely manages to win the 1936 general election, and the days following their victory are sullied by anarchists rampaging throughout the streets of Spain and the release of numerous political prisoners. Desperate to restore order and crush the anarchists and communists, 
Traditionalists, monarchists, fascists, nationalists, and the military conspire to overthrow the Spanish Republic and save Spain from what they view as further chaos. These groups together form the Nationalist Coalition. On January 17, 1936, a coup is launched against the Republic by the Nationalists, whose military forces were mainly in Spanish Morocco at the time. While the Republic retained control of most of the nation, they lose critical areas in southern Spain, allowing the Nationalists to ferry their army into the Iberian Peninsula. Furthermore, the conservative-leading colonial governments in Puerto Rico and the Spanish Pacific soon pledge fealty to the Nationalist cause. With the outbreak of the conflict, the far left demanded that the government arm the workers to combat the nationalists. However, due to more governmental infighting, these crucial first days following the uprising were squandered, as the coup attempt quickly deteriorated into civil war. For three years, the nationalist forces, led by General Francisco Franco and supported by fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, fought against the republican forces, led by Juan Negrin and supported by the Soviet Union and countless international volunteers. Throughout the war, massacres become frequent as the nationalists work to remove potential future threats to their regime and the republicans seek to commit reprisals. The nationalists benefit from strong leadership under General Franco, while the republic suffers as the alliance between the communists, anarchists, and republicans weakens every day. In 1938, the republic's forces suffer a disastrous defeat at the Battle of the Ebro, which sees the nationalists gain the upper hand in the war. Following their defeat at the Ebro, the Republic suffers a complete military collapse of the northern and northeastern areas under Republican control. In February 1939, Catalonia, long a major base of Republican support, falls to nationalist forces in what many correctly viewed as the beginning of the end for the Spanish Republic. With the fall of Catalonia, the nationalists now controlled much of the country, while the Republicans only held on to key cities in eastern and central Spain, including the capital, Madrid. Throughout the war, Prime Minister Juan Negrin had further chipped away at Spanish democracy by taking on further dictatorial powers and was an extremely unpopular leader as a result. Many saw Negrin as having aspirations of being a communist dictator, and their government's reputation suffered accordingly. Caught between the anarchists and communists, some centrist Spanish Republicans, horrified at their current situation, decided to take action. In our timeline, with the end of the war in sight, the Spanish Republicans, led by Republican Colonel Segismundo Casado, launched a coup against Negrin. Negrin insisted that the war was winnable and that the Republic should continue to fight, while the Republicans saw that the war was unwinnable and overthrew Negrin to negotiate a peaceful surrender to Franco's nationalists and avoid further bloodshed, thus ending the Spanish Civil War with a total victory for the nationalist cause, with Spain under the totalitarian regime of General Franco which would only end with his death in 1975, after which Spain finally transitioned to democracy. However, in this alternate timeline, a completely different series of events begins to unfold. Furious and out of patience with Prime Minister Negrin's delusional belief that the Republic could still win the war, on February 12, 1939, a group of Republican dissidents forms El Consejo Nacional de Defensa, or the National Defense Council. The National Defense Council, later known as the Casadistas, is not formed to surrender to Franco, as in our timeline, but instead with the stated aim of ensuring the Republic's survival at any cost. Colonel Segismundo Casado is recruited to lead the group, just as in our timeline, and is the source of the group's nickname, the Casadistas. Casado immediately begins to draft a contingency plan. Luckily for the Casadistas, throughout the war, most of Spain's naval vessels were retained by the Republic, as were many commercial vessels off Spain's eastern coast. Likewise, much of the Spanish Navy's enlisted servicemen had also sided with the Republic. Accordingly, Casado and the Casadistas draw up plans to evacuate mainland Spain and set up a government in exile. The Baliarch Islands, Canary Islands, Spanish Morocco, Spanish Sahara, and Spanish Guinea are all suggested as possible readouts for the beleaguered Spanish Republic. However, Casado rejects all of these locations due to the fact that firstly, their populations are either extremely pro-nationalist and would be difficult to subdue, or they are too close to the Spanish mainland, and Franco would be able to reach them there. Casado states that the Republic needs a place to go and recuperate temporarily, in anticipation of a future reclamation of the mainland. Then, one of the coup plotters brings up the possibility of Puerto Rico. Far away from the Spanish mainland, the current Puerto Rican colonial government is very pro-Franco, but the population is not. Many Puerto Ricans despise the current colonial government due to its links to the Primo de Rivera dictatorship, 
While the Puerto Rican nationalist movement is moribund, there remains animosity towards the Primo de Rivera dictatorship and the terrors of Spanish colonialism in Puerto Rico. Casado recognizes that this animosity could be exploited to facilitate regime change in Puerto Rico, and decides that the Spanish Republic should make its last stand there. The rest of the National Defense Council agrees, and on February 19, 1939, the Casadistas begin planning an evacuation from the mainland to the island of Puerto Rico. On February 21, 1939, Casado sends out representatives to both the American Embassy in Madrid as well as the Mexican Embassy in Madrid to relay his plans to Presidents Roosevelt and Cárdenas, both Republican sympathizers. Casado also sends undercover agents to Puerto Rico to gauge local support for a general uprising to remove the colonial regime and install a Republican one. When briefed on the situation, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt of the United States and President Lazaro Cárdenas of Mexico decide to covertly support Casado's plans for a government in exile in Puerto Rico. On March 1, 1939, Casado's agents returned from San Juan with good news. They have identified and contacted several key individuals willing to lend their support for a pro-Republican uprising, including General Pedro Albizu Campos, a politically-minded military figure who is the highest-ranking indigenous Puerto Rican in the island's military, and Blanca Canales, a major activist within the workers' and women's rights movement on Puerto Rico. Albizu and Canales agree to organize an uprising in San Juan to divert the military's attention away from any imminent threats, allowing the Republicans to land in Puerto Rico and have the element of surprise. With support for their coup secured from all pertinent parties, on March 10, 1939, the Casadistas launched their coup against Negrin throughout Republican-controlled Spain. The Casadista coup succeeds due to growing anti-Negrin sentiment, and Colonel Casado takes effective control of the areas still under Republican rule by March 11. Negrin and his government are successfully captured and quickly executed as the Casadistas purge the government of communists and break off their alliance with the anarchists. Global analysts are baffled, as is General Franco. Why would the Republic attack itself just before its loss? However, Colonel Casado soon surprises everyone as his plans become apparent. On March 15, 1939, the Spanish Republic's expeditionary force departs from the Republican port city of Alicante and manages to execute a breakout through the Strait of Gibraltar. The few ships under Franco's command are unable to counter the Republic's naval superiority. This first fleet of ships paves the way for many more to come. Colonel Casado, now acting as the wartime leader of the Republic, assumes emergency powers not too dissimilar to Negrin's, albeit with a radically different goal. A general evacuation order is put out to all Republicans and their families, and the Republican military shifts its strategy from combating the Nationalists to engaging in a tactical retreat. Casado has the National Treasury in Madrid emptied and loaded onto numerous vessels at the port of Alicante. However, the voyages to Puerto Rico are often a week to two weeks long and military-oriented, and accordingly, many Republicans flee to France to catch a commercial ship to the Caribbean from there instead. On March 21, 1939, Republican forces make landfall in Puerto Rico. Although the island was fortified long ago, the nationalist military presence on the island had suffered from the repeated reassignment of soldiers to fight on the mainland. The Battle of Puerto Rico begins that same day. Adding to the nationalists' woes is a massive revolt of native Puerto Rican soldiers and civilians against the nationalists led by Pedro Albizu Campos. Albizu Campos' uprising rocks the Puerto Rican capital of San Juan, just as early reports come in that Republican troops have made landfall in the port city of Fajardo. Together, by the skin of their teeth, the Republic's forces and Albizu Campos' rebels manage to topple the colonial government of Puerto Rico. Following the cessation of hostilities on the island, a deluge of Spanish Republican refugees from Spain and France arrive. While at first the refugees number in the tens of thousands, eventually the total number of refugees reaches 500,000 people. The most notable of these exiles is the famous Spanish artist Pablo Picasso. Although he continues to spend most of his life in France, as in our timeline, he also maintains a residence in San Juan, Puerto Rico. As a symbol of support for the Republican government, Picasso allows his famous anti-war painting, Guernica, to be displayed at the Museum of Art of Puerto Rico under a long-term loan. Later on, Picasso would lend his services to the Republic and serve as an advisor for the production of propaganda. As the evacuation efforts continue, the Casadistas fight to buy more time. Likewise, during this time, the anarchist and communist movements resort to guerrilla warfare against both the nationalists and Republicans. After nearly two months of prolonged bloodshed, on May 1, 1939, Colonel Casado declares that the government and military have done all they can, and that evacuation efforts will cease by the end of the month. With this news, 
any remaining Republicans on the mainland make a desperate rush towards the port of Alicante or the French border. On May 7, 1939, the city of Madrid falls to General Franco's forces. As the nationalists pour into the devastated city, they find it empty, much like the National Treasury Building. Colonel Casado had personally remained in Madrid until the day it fell to direct its defense with fellow members of the National Defense Council. With his family and much of his government already in Puerto Rico, Casado's personal plane takes off from Madrid Barajas Airport just as the airport's perimeter is breached by nationalist soldiers. It would be the last time he would ever set foot in the city for the next three decades. On May 8th, a general retreat of the last Republican forces began, and by May 15th, 1939, the port city of Alicante was abandoned as the last Republican vessels departed the mainland and Franco's forces took all of mainland Spain. On May 31st, 1939, Colonel Casado's vessel arrives in Fajardo, Puerto Rico, and he is shuttled directly to San Juan. Early in the afternoon, a crowd of beleaguered refugees gathers in San Juan's Plaza de Armas to hear the colonel's speech. Colonel Casado walks out onto the balcony of City Hall. The colonel is gaunt, clad in a cloak, and with Pedro Albizu Campos by his side. Colonel Casado launches into a fiery speech lambasting both the fascists and communists who doomed Spain's democracy. My fellow citizens of the Republic of Spain, today, as I look out into the crowd, I see many faces, faces of uncertainty, misery, and hopelessness. In the course of every great nation, their fortunes have ebbed and flowed. This is not the first time the Spanish people have had to endure a hardship. What true son of Spain could ever forget when the Moors conquered our lands and our culture was nearly annihilated, or when our empire collapsed before our very eyes? And now another dark time has washed over our people. But the Spanish people and their republic have shown their ability to endure. In just a few months, you all managed to evacuate the true patriots of Spain to safety here in Puerto Rico. Franco and the fascist bandits he commands, have only momentarily triumphed thanks to his masters in Rome and Berlin. The sad fact is that right now, our compatriots across mainland Spain are beholden to foreign interests, but this will not stand. From our new home here in Puerto Rico, we will retake the mainland. We will rebuild our armies and the institutions they serve. We will ensure that every inch of Spanish land is illuminated by the light of democracy and we will never surrender to the whims of the fascist butchers. Long live the people, long live the workers, long live the republic, and long live Spain. Following Casado's speech, the crowd erupts in the cheers. Casado's speech at the Plaza de Armas would later go down in history as one of the most monumental speeches in Spanish history. For many Puerto Ricans who'd risked everything in the uprising, they feel secure knowing that they made the right choice. For Casado's loyal Republicans, the speech instills in them much-needed hope for their current situation. Casado wastes no time in ensuring that his speech was not simply empty words. Throughout June 1939, he works to instill stability across Puerto Rico. For his first act as the Republic's head of state, he uses the gold taken from the national treasury to stabilize the Republic's currency, the peseta, which was suffering from extreme inflation due to the Civil War. Then, he immediately negotiates food aid treaties with Mexico and the United States in order to accommodate Puerto Rico's population, which has drastically increased in a short period. Next, order is restored as Republicans and natives fill vacant positions within the island's government and institutions. Captured nationalist soldiers are repatriated or voluntarily defect to the Republican cause. An unexpected ally for the Spanish Republic, now referred to in the English-speaking world as Free Spain and the Spanish-speaking world as España Libre, comes in the form of Cuba. In the 42 years since its independence from Spain, Cuba has emerged as a middle power within the Caribbean. Much of the animosity towards Spain has since faded amongst many Cubans, and now the people of Cuba wish to aid free Spain after its devastating loss. Cuban President Carlos Prio Socaras launches an outreach program to help restart free Spain's trade network and rejuvenate its economy. Furthermore, after a state visit to Havana by Segismundo Casado on June 15, 1939, the two nations sign a treaty to allow Free Spain to freely send conscripts to be trained by the Cuban military. After all, even though Francisco Franco's regime currently lacks the naval or monetary resources to retake Puerto Rico, Casado's regime will need a modern and effective military presence to deter Franco in the future, but cannot currently train the necessary number of men due to a lack of military instructors and infrastructure. 
Cuba fills this void and aids free Spain. Also during this time, the National Defense Council begins to draft a new constitution better suited to the Republic's current situation, discarding the old constitution that governed them on the mainland. Soon enough, a new government is created, in which Puerto Rico, as a province of Spain, is governed by an elected governor, who is allowed sizable autonomy. In turn, the governor answers to a democratically elected unicameral legislative Cortes, drastically downsized from its mainland counterpart. However, the position of president is temporarily abolished, with executive power held by the National Defense Council, which is granted this authority within the new constitution during periods of national emergency. Accordingly, in June 1939, Colonel Segismundo Casado declares a national emergency across free Spain, implementing a new governing document alongside the new constitution, titled The Temporary Provisions Effective During the Period of National Mobilization for the Suppression of the Fascist Insurrection. Through this document, the chairman of the National Defense Council, which is himself, functions as Spain's executive and head of state. With this new constitution approved in a referendum held across Puerto Rico in July 1939, a follow-up provincial election is held on August 5, 1939 which sees the Spanish Reunification Party, a coalition party of Spanish Republican exiles and Puerto Rican politicians, sweep the election, gaining a supermajority in the Cortes in San Juan. To the joy of Puerto Ricans across the island, Pedro Albizu Campos is elected as the first governor of the province of Puerto Rico, while Blanca Canales is elected as president of the Cortes, and so it would be that the Spanish Republic achieved full democratic suffrage locally whilst under the authority of an unelected military strongman, Colonel Casado. With its situation rapidly stabilizing, Many countries continue to recognize the Republic of Spain as the sole legitimate government of Spain, including the United States, Canada, Mongolia, Ethiopia, the Soviet Union, as well as every single nation in Latin America. Unfortunately, all of Europe breaks off relations with the Spanish Republic, instead choosing to recognize, while not necessarily approving of, Francisco Franco's Spanish state. The rest of 1939 is spent expanding Puerto Rico's infrastructure and agricultural industry to support the massive influx of refugees from the mainland. However, once more, the fortunes of Casado and his republic are destined to change, and in retrospect, historians credit Casado's rapid response in stabilizing the republic with saving it as a whole. As Francisco Franco works to rebuild war-torn mainland Spain with aid from fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, he orders a general crackdown on dissent across Spain's remaining territories. Across Spanish colonies in Africa and the Pacific, Independence movements have arisen to capitalize on post-war Spain's perceived weakness, and uprisings against the fascist dictator are reported throughout Spanish colonies. Franco is furious with the developing situation and blames the uprisings on perceived American and Mexican interference in Spanish affairs, and lambasts Free Spain's allies for what he terms as splitting the magnificent Spanish nation in half. In Agaña, the heart of the Spanish Pacific, a spontaneous protest breaks out on October 1, 1939, following the shooting of an unarmed young man by fascist soldiers. The protest soon developed into a full-blown riot in support of independence from Spain as colonial authorities in the Pacific scrambled to prevent an uprising or general strike. Following Franco's new policies of zero tolerance for dissent, soldiers are deployed to the epicenter of the protests in Agaña's Plaza de España a massive town square in front of the Spanish Pacific Governor's Palace. As the protesters refuse to disperse, despite being ordered to by the military, the soldiers soon begin to fire into the crowd. While the fascist government states in a press release that only 20 people were killed and 50 wounded, eyewitnesses say that the government killed at least 200 people that day in October. Soon, news of the Agaña massacre spreads to the other Mariana Islands and the Caroline Islands, and social unrest begins testing the authorities across the island chains. By October 8, 1939, reports emerge that Franco's regime has put down at least five more uprisings whose casualty estimates are unavailable but assumed to be high. Across the free world, condemnations of fascist Spain's actions in the Spanish Pacific pour out as demonstrations of solidarity with the islanders are held throughout Puerto Rico. Colonel Segismundo Casado, however, sees an opportunity not only to grow his area of influence but also to end the bloodshed in the Pacific and earn a much-needed win for the Republican cause. On October 15, 1939, Segismundo Casado undertakes a covert visit to Mexico City to meet with Mexican President Lazaro Cárdenas and U.S. Ambassador to Mexico Josephus Daniels. During the Mexico City meeting, Colonel Casado makes a convincing argument that the Spanish Republic should be allowed to annex the Spanish Pacific to end the bloodshed there and prevent the situation from deteriorating further. 
Furthermore, Casado argues, only the Republican exile in Puerto Rico is close enough to affect change in the lives of the islanders and bring democracy to them. President Cárdenas is convinced by Casado's argument and agrees to lease the free Spanish government a small concession in Baja California's port of Ensenada to use as a staging ground for military operations in the Pacific, while Josephus Daniels promises to relay the developing situation to Washington and gauge if any further aid for a military expedition could be provided. A week later, a telegram for Casado is received in San Juan from Josephus Daniels. Although no further military aid can be provided, the Spanish Republicans are given assurances of safe passage through the Panama Canal, with further assurances that the canal will be closed to any Spanish nationalist vessels seeking to cross through. Furthermore, the U.S. port of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii has been notified that the Spanish Republic will be deploying several fleets to the Marianas and has informed the Spanish Republican Navy that they will be allowed to refuel and restock in Hawaii on their way to the Marianas. While they are currently unable to launch any counteroffensive to retake the mainland, Casado is confident that his military would be strong enough to liberate the islands if they could stage another uprising amongst the Chamorro people of the Marianas and the islanders of the Caroline Islands, and replicated their invasion strategy employed during the liberation of Puerto Rico. Following this logic, Casado begins moving ships through Panama to be stationed at the port of Ensenada. Much like Pedro Albizu Campos facilitated the Republican takeover of Puerto Rico, Casado's opportunity to seize the Spanish Pacific comes in the form of Manuel Flores León Guerrero. Guerrero, a 25-year-old local administrator in the colonial government and keeper of financial records, has emerged as the face of a burgeoning independence movement on Guajan. Guerrero first came to prominence as a whistleblower when, in the days following the Agaña massacre, he exposed the extensive corruption that existed within the current Spanish colonial administration in the Pacific, adding further fuel to the fire. Guerrero was able to publish his evidence in the Spanish Pacific's biggest newspaper, El Pacifico, showing that the funds intended to be used for infrastructure, health care, and other vital sectors of society for the islands were instead being redirected by Francisco Franco's new fascist government to cushion the economic blow suffered by the Spanish elite in the aftermath of the Spanish Civil War. This immediately causes Guerrero to become both a hero across the islands as well as a wanted man by the Spanish authorities. On October 21st, 1939, the protests on Guajan results in the temporary loss of fascist control over the city of Agaña, including the temporary seizure of the telegraph office. Seizing upon this moment, Colonel Casado orders that a high-priority telegram be sent to the protesters on Guajan, informing them of the Republic's desire to collaborate with them to overthrow Franco's authorities across the Spanish Pacific. In the telegram, Casado is succinct in his vision for the future. The Spanish Republic and the islanders of the Spanish Pacific share a common enemy in Franco's fascist regime. However, he also notes that Guerrero and his allies are currently pursuing immediate independence from Spain and do not wish to see Franco's brutal regime replaced with Casado's regime, as either way, the Spanish Pacific would not be independent. And so, Casado proposes a temporary solution. If Guerrero were to rally the Chamorro people of the Marianas to help Casado's Spanish Republican forces to liberate the Spanish Pacific, this would expand the current Spanish Republic's territory and give it a much-needed propaganda victory, as well as give them access to numerous ports to facilitate trade between Free Spain, Asia, and the Western United States. For the islanders, aiding the Spanish Republic comes with a guarantee of an immediate end to the current colonial government. The elevation of the Spanish Pacific from a colony to a province of the Spanish Republic complete with full suffrage for every islander, and a guarantee by the Republic's military to defend the islands from any and all foreign parties. Casado notes that even if the islanders were able to overthrow Franco's authorities in the Pacific, he would eventually send a military expedition to reconquer them. And if he didn't, they could easily fall prey to other world powers, mainly the increasingly imperialistic Japanese Empire. So, if the islanders aid the Republic, the Republic will keep the islanders under their protection with a promise of eventual independence. A few days after Casado's telegram is sent, the colonial authorities retake Agaña in a bloody struggle against the protesters. This leaves the National Defense Council doubtful as to whether or not Guerrero had received their message. Luckily, one week later, on October 28, 1939, Colonel Casado receives a reply from Guerrero himself. Guerrero, while initially reluctant, has taken all of Casado's points into account and after a meeting with other figures of the independence movement, now calling themselves the Militat Tao Tao, Guerrero agrees to Casado's proposition and relays to him his plans to stage an uprising across the islands of Guajan, Palau, Saipan, Tinian, Sarpana, 
and Yap on December 1st, allowing time for the Spanish Republican military expedition to sail from western Mexico. Upon receiving the message, Colonel Casado immediately issues a general mobilization order and places the Spanish Republic on a war footing. On November 1st, the military expedition departs from Ensenada with the mission of liberating the Spanish Pacific. As planned, on December 1st, using arms stolen from several supply depots, the Militat Tautau stages a general uprising across the Spanish Pacific in tandem with the Spanish Republic's forces staging an amphibious landing operation at the port of San Luis de Opera in the bustling port city of Piti. As the Militat Tautau disrupts the day-to-day -day functions of the colonial government, the fascist military stationed in Piti is taken by surprise as a mix of veteran and freshly recruited Spanish Republican soldiers climb the seawalls in Port Opera and swiftly take the city of Piti. With Franco's colonial government in chaos, the coalition force of the Militat Tau Tau and the Spanish Republican army make quick work of the military presence on the island, aided by the native Chamorro people. By December 3rd, the Spanish Republic had taken total control of the entire island of Guajan, and from there swiftly deployed more forces to take control of the rest of the Mariana Islands. This is accomplished by mid-December, due to the exhausted and depleted fascist forces being unable to continue resisting the onslaught of the coalition forces. From the Marianas, Casado orders a troop surge across the Caroline Islands, successfully dislodging Franco's forces across the Spanish Pacific. The situation in the region deteriorates for the fascist authorities so quickly that by Christmas, Francisco Franco's government had lost effective control over the entire region. Although technically still under Spanish rule, across the Spanish Pacific, the Islanders and Republicans ring in New Year 1940 with jubilation and merrymaking, as for many peoples, this is the most freedom they have enjoyed since the Spanish Empire first colonized their islands centuries ago. Guerrero is quickly installed as the provincial governor, and works to change the current legal system to grant full suffrage to the people of the Spanish Pacific, as the Republic moves to re-establish order throughout the inhabited islands. However, while this wave of change is met with jubilation in the Pacific and pride and relief in Puerto Rico, Segismundo Casado, Gaudillo of the Republic, is anxious. In September of last year, Nazi Germany invaded Poland and had begun the Second World War, which now saw Europe in crisis as fascism began to spread even further. While both countries were technically neutral, Colonel Casado pledged to aid the Allies in any possible way, while Franco continued to do business with Nazi Germany and Italy. Likewise, in Asia, the Japanese Empire had expanded its war in China, and its economy had begun to suffer in the face of sanctions by Britain and the United States, which, in turn, escalated tensions between all three powers. With tensions rising across the globe, Colonel Casado worries that the Spanish Republic will soon be drawn into the larger global conflict. While acquiring the Spanish Pacific territories from fascist Spain was a boon for morale and resources within the Republic, it also put the nation in Japan's trajectory of conquest. Colonel Casado orders a military buildup in the Spanish Pacific to prepare for any attempted invasion. As contingency plans are drafted and soldiers shipped from San Juan to Agaña, Colonel Casado works to deepen the Hispano-American alliance through frequent visits to Washington, D.C. The rest of 1940 is nearly identical to our timeline, with the exception of the Spanish Republic continuing in exile and working to repair its economy and military. The rapid military buildup and industrialization effort on Puerto Rico and the Pacific Islands, driven by Free Spain's gold reserves, is soon termed Operación Manos a la Obra, or Operation Bootstrap. Under the careful guidance of the National Defense Council, in close coordination with Albizu Campos and Guerrero's provisional governments, Operation Bootstrap manages to be executed successfully, with widespread economic growth across the Republic by the end of the year, buoyed by close economic ties to the nations of Latin America especially Mexico and Cuba. During this time, the diplomatic relationship between the United States and the Empire of Japan had begun to deteriorate rapidly. Following the conquest of numerous British and French colonial possessions in Asia by Japan, as well as numerous atrocities being committed by Japan in China, the United States had begun to impose sanctions. Finally, in the summer of 1941, the United States implemented an oil embargo on Japan, severely hampering its war effort across Asia. From their foothold in Asia, the Marshall Islands, the United States of America had begun to pose a significant threat to Japan's dream of Asia under Japanese hegemony. Accordingly, Japan began plotting to wage war against the United States. A key component of Japanese power in the Pacific was the state of the Philippines. Since its independence in 1905, 
the state of the Philippines had long since abandoned any trappings of democratic governance. Emilio Aguinaldo, the leader of the Philippine independence movement, had cemented himself as the supreme leader of the Philippines, and over the past few decades had overseen the creation of a dictatorship on the island nation. Heavily militarized, the Philippines had only grown closer to Japan since its independence, and the closeness of the Filipino-Japanese relationship was a source of anxiety for many regional powers in Asia. In the summer of 1940, the Japanese Empire announced the creation of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, with Japan, Manchukuo, and the state of the Philippines as its founding member states. In accordance with their new alliance, Aguinaldo allowed Japanese troops to be stationed in the Philippines, a measure he framed as a necessary concession to retain the Philippines' independence from the Western colonial powers. However, the Japanese military quickly earned themselves a negative reputation in the Philippines due to their negative views of the locals and propensity for violence. In reaction to this flagrant violation of the Philippines' national sovereignty, a military revolt, fomented and funded by the Allies, broke out in the Philippines in hopes of igniting a civil war. At the helm of the revolt is Philippine Army Captain Ramon Magsaysay, who announces that the military revolt's aims are the restoration of the Philippines' national sovereignty and democracy. However, the revolt is nowhere near the size needed to dislodge Aguinaldo's regime. Aguinaldo chips away at the revolt's support amongst the citizenry by framing Magsaysay as a Western puppet, and in coordination with the Japanese troops stationed in the islands, Aguinaldo is successfully able to crush the revolt and remain in power. With Magsaysay and his inner circle in danger of execution, the United States offers the surviving Filipino rebels asylum as they flee their homeland. However, not wishing to damage their diplomatic relationship with the Japanese further at this moment, the United States uses its leverage as Free Spain's largest benefactor to have Colonel Casado take in the rebels in the Spanish Pacific. This successfully delays the outbreak of war between Japan and the U.S. in 1940, but causes Japan to sever diplomatic relations with Free Spain and recognize Franco's regime instead. With the Philippines preparing to aid in the expansion of Japan's empire, the United States remaining steadfast in its sanctions on Japan, and the islanders, republicans, and Filipino exiles fortifying themselves in the Spanish Pacific, 1940 draws to a close with a massive military showdown in the Pacific on the horizon between Free Spain, the United States, and the Japanese Empire. A high point for the Republican forces in the Spanish Pacific comes in mid-1941, when the Spanish Minister of Defense, Field Marshal Vicente Rojo, arrived in Agaña without notice, sent to the Pacific by Colonel Casado in order to take direct command of the province's defense in the event of an attack. Aside from Free Spain continuing to prepare for the outbreak of war in cooperation with the United States, 1941 more or less follows the same trajectory as our timeline until December 7, 1941. On this day, the Empire of Japan launches a surprise attack against both the United States and the Spanish Republic. The Japanese launch an invasion of the Marshall Islands, bomb Pearl Harbor in a failed attempt to weaken the United States naval power in the Pacific, and bomb the Mariana Islands to weaken the Spanish defenses in preparation for a future land invasion. Air raid sirens come alive across the Spanish Pacific as Nakajima bombers and Zero fighters soar over the islands. Apra Harbor, where the Spanish Republic had made landfall two years prior, takes the brunt of the assault as it is where the Spanish Republic's main Pacific fleet is located. Within minutes of the Japanese surprise attack being launched, Upper Harbor, along with most of the Spanish fleet, is soon completely ablaze, and martial law is declared across the Spanish Pacific by Governor Guerrero. Following the contingency plan drafted in cooperation with Colonel Casado, Guerrero issues an order allowing the supplying of arms to every able-bodied citizen of the Spanish Pacific. Likewise, that same day, an evacuation notice is sent out across the Caroline Islands, if the Spanish Pacific is to survive the coming onslaught, they cannot stretch themselves thin defending every island from the Japanese. Governor Guerrero reasons that if they are to stand a chance, the Republic must make its stand on Tinian, Saipan, Sarpana, and Guahan, as the four core islands boast the best fortification and infrastructure to be able to resist the invaders. Within 24 hours, news of the attack on the Pacific reaches the capital of San Juan, Colonel Casado convenes an emergency meeting of the National Defense Council, wherein they firstly discuss their relief at Guerrero's leadership thus far in executing the contingency plan. Casado informs the council that he has spoken with the American ambassador and that a small detachment of American naval forces will be deployed to Puerto Rico 
to deter Franco's forces should his government enter the war on the side of the Axis powers. Likewise, a more robust fleet of Cuban vessels is en route already to aid in a potential defense of Puerto Rico. Although they did not know it at the time, the fascist regime on the mainland was incapable of waging war against any nation, and the feared invasion of Puerto Rico would not occur. The real fight would be in the Marianas. By December 8th, the province of the Spanish Pacific is in chaos, evacuation orders being issued across the Caroline Islands, soldiers being shuttled to various locations in the Marianas, trenches being dug, signal lights being set up, and barricades being erected, as per the order of Field Marshal Vicente Rojo. Aiding Rojo in the defense of the Marianas is Captain Ramon Magsaysay. Magsaysay's Filipino rebels wish to repay the kindness of the islanders by aiding them in any way possible, and Magsaysay's experience and tactical mind are hugely beneficial to the Republican military authorities in the Marianas. Unlike in our timeline, where the United States military garrison on the Marianas was defeated by the Japanese in the three days following the attack on Pearl Harbor, in this timeline, the massive Spanish military presence on the island forces the Japanese to spend more time preparing an invasion, and thus the Marianas remain in free Spanish control going into 1942. After the initial surprise attack, the Spanish Republicans enjoy a brief respite to regroup and focus on the fortification of the Marianas and the evacuation of the Caroline Islands. The main reason for this is that most of the Japanese military forces in the region are currently focusing on taking the Marshall Islands from the United States. They are eventually successful, and the Marshall Islands fall in January of 1942, with the Americans evacuating the islands whilst vowing to return and retake them. By the time the Marshall Islands fall in 1942, the Caroline Islands have been successfully evacuated and have also fallen under Japanese control. With the Japanese advancing across the Pacific and the United States still mobilizing, Free Spain faces the prospect of defending against a Japanese invasion of the Mariana Islands with only their still recovering military, the Filipino exiles, and the Chamorro civilian militias. The United States is already sending ships to defend Puerto Rico, which is more strategically important than the Marianas, and because of its current mobilization, the United States cannot spare any further military aid at the moment outside of supplies. Cuba's military is strong, but its navy isn't capable of prolonged warfare in the Pacific. However, in the absence of the Cuban or American military support Free Spain requires after the Spanish fleet was bombed at Upper Harbor, Mexico steps in to help. At the invitation of the National Defense Council, Mexican President Manuel Avila Camacho pays a visit to San Juan, Puerto Rico on January 21, 1942, to meet with Colonel Casado. Casado gives Camacho several concessions, mostly in the realm of trade, in order to facilitate Mexican support for the Spanish Republic, including helping to improve Mexico's naval resources. Camacho, in turn, requests that Mexico's General Congress issue a declaration of war against the Empire of Japan. As expected, the General Congress fulfills Camacho's request, and on January 27, 1942, the nation of Mexico issues a declaration of war against Japan and begins mobilizing its naval forces to reinforce the Spanish in the Marianas before the Japanese invasion begins. The Mexican declaration of war cannot come soon enough. By late January, Spanish naval intelligence reports that Japan is massing troops on the island of Peleliu, just a few miles south of Guahan. With Peleliu as their staging ground, Japan could strike at any moment. Within hours of the Mexican declaration of war, the Spanish port of Ensenada becomes packed, as soldiers and cargo are shuttled to the port to set sail for the Marianas immediately. Likewise, the United States opens the Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, to Mexican conscripts to aid in Mexico's mobilization effort. While the initial Mexican expedition sets sail for the Marianas on the 29th of January, it does not arrive soon enough. On February 1st, 1942, Japanese Imperial forces, under the command of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, make landfall in the southern village of Mariso, on Guahan. The small mixed garrison of Filipino and Spanish soldiers buckles under the power of the Japanese human wave attacks, and the village falls within an hour of the invasion commencing. The fall of Mariso is merely the beginning. In the following days, the Japanese make quick work of the Spanish forces across southern Guahan, despite their valiant resistance. As Free Spain's lines of communication break down across southern Guahan, the remaining forces, hesitant to surrender due to knowledge of Japan's ruthlessness, decide to flee into the island's jungles to continue the fight via guerrilla warfare. The path to Agaña, the heart of the Spanish Pacific, is now clear for the Japanese. By February 4th, most of the island is under Japanese control. Japanese forces also make landfall in northern Guahan, Saipan, and Tinian to support Yamamoto's push to take the Mariana Islands. 
Field Marshal Rojo recalls all remaining military forces on the island to the capital of Agaña, determined to make his stand there. Within hours, all remaining military personnel have taken up defensive positions throughout the city. At the time, any observer, if you'd asked them, would have told you that victory was secured for Japan. However, what Field Marshal Rojo was about to accomplish was a shock to everyone. Field Marshal Rojo had left certain parts of the city with only token defenses in an effort to lure the Japanese into a trap. With the south and east undefended, the Japanese army quickly pushed toward the city. However, just as they breached the outskirts, Field Marshal Rojo launched a counterattack from the jungles north of the city, cutting off the invading forces in the city outskirts from their forces still on the roads outside the city. The defenders fought the battle as if it were their last, one eyewitness later recalled. From there, Rojo launched an encirclement of the Japanese on the roads, crushing them with a ferocity that stunned even the most hardened Japanese commanders. While naval support would have turned the tide of the battle, the Japanese navy, who infamously hated their army counterparts, refused to aid the army in stopping the counterattack, confident in their capabilities to take the city themselves after the army was crushed. However, as the Japanese offensive lost its momentum, the invading force, who'd fought to the death, were crushed, leaving Free Spain victorious in what war historians would later term the miracle on the Rio Agaña. While Agaña was successfully defended, the Spanish still had their work cut out for them in terms of retaking the island. Spanish artillery managed to repel the naval assault as order was restored to the capital, and Field Marshal Rojo ordered a counteroffensive to repel the northern Japanese offensive there, which the defenders managed to achieve with the assistance of Governor Guerrero's Militao militias scattered throughout the island. From there, the weakened Japanese forces in the south are pushed back as well, aided by the guerrilla fighters in the jungles. While a costly endeavor, Spain manages to hold on to Guajan, but just barely retaking the last parts of the island on February 11, 1942. However, Saipan and Tenian have fallen to the Japanese, and reports from survivors fleeing through Guahan indicate large-scale atrocities being committed by the Japanese against prisoners of war. While disturbing, at this moment, there is nothing that the Spanish can do. Field Marshal Rojo sends a telegram to San Juan informing Colonel Casado of Spain's losses. While they have held Guahan, they will not survive another Japanese offensive. Luckily for Spain, intelligence indicates that despite the loss of the northern Mariana Islands, Japan is currently having to reassess its priorities, as the United States prepares a large summer offensive in the Pacific. Because of this, Guahan will most likely be safe from a counterattack for the next few weeks. After nearly three weeks of preparation for another counterattack, on February 27, 1942, Field Marshal Rojo's reinforcements arrive, comprised of freshly trained Spanish and Mexican recruits, as well as veteran Mexican naval forces. Using this to his advantage, throughout spring 1942, Field Marshal Rojo is able to defend Guahan from further Japanese offensives, becoming a thorn in the side of Tokyo and a national hero to the peoples of Free Spain. In April and June, further reinforcements arrive as the military leadership in San Juan realizes that Franco has all but abandoned his plans for retaking Puerto Rico, at least for the time being. With this realization comes a reorientation of national defense priorities, putting the defense of the Spanish Pacific first. Because of this, Cuba also begins sending troops and military aid to the port of Ensenada to reinforce the Marianas. Because their navy isn't capable of warfare in the Pacific, the Cuban Expeditionary Force, commanded by Colonel Fulgencio Batista, is transported to the Pacific via Spanish and Mexican vessels. The war's major turning point for Free Spain comes in June 1942, when the Japanese Empire suffered a crippling loss at the Battle of Midway and the United States began to dislodge the Japanese across the Pacific Islands. Following the Japanese defeat at Midway, Field Marshal Rojo launched two simultaneous counteroffensives to retake Saipan and Tenian, catching the Japanese, who'd focused the majority of their Pacific resources on fighting the United States, off guard. A large component of the recapture of the Marianas was the Maquis. The Maquis was the name later given to groups of Spanish, Filipino, and Islander guerrilla soldiers who fled into the jungles of Saipan and Tinian and prevented the Japanese from ever establishing complete control of the northern Mariana Islands. The Maquis would later go down in history, commended for their valor in the liberation of Saipan and Tinian, as well as their role in evacuating civilians to their jungle outposts to save the population from Japanese atrocities. The entire Mariana Island chain is successfully retaken by coalition forces under Field Marshal Rojo's command. However, even now, the coalition is not strong enough to dislodge the Japanese from the Caroline Islands painfully realizing this after several disastrous offensives. Content with their success in liberating the whole of the Marianas and evacuating the Carolines, 
the Spanish Republic spends the rest of 1942 recovering from the defense of the islands, all while the United States continues to make progress in the Pacific War and Japan becomes further bogged down across Asia. A major morale boost comes in August 1942, when Colonel Segismundo Casado, leader of the Spanish Republic, pays a visit to the capital of Agaña, complete with a military parade and festivities hosted by Field Marshal Rojo and Governor Guerrero. Casado delivers a speech to a crowd of soldiers and civilian fighters on August 5, 1942, in which he praises the valiant fighting spirit of the peoples of the Pacific as well as the soldiers of Free Spain, Cuba, and Mexico. A major highlight of 1943 was when Isoroku Yamamoto, mastermind of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, the Marshall Islands, and the Mariana Islands, was killed following the interception of his personal plane by Spain's 1st Coalition Fighter Squadron, composed of pilots from the Free Spanish 1st Fighter Squadron and the Mexican Aztec Eagles 201st Fighter Squadron. Well not intended, during a reconnaissance flight by Free Spanish Coalition forces, Yamamoto's plane and his escort were spotted, recognized, and shot down by the 1st Fighter Squadron's leader, Republican flying ace Andres Garcia Lacalle. This provided a huge morale boost throughout the Allied nations of the Pacific Theater, especially in the United States, and resulted in the American public's perception of Colonel Casado's regime reaching upwards of 75% of Americans having a positive view of free Spain. 1943 would also see the liberation of the Caroline Islands following a bloody victory at the Battle of Peleliu, but not by Spain. Instead, the American flag rose over the Caroline Islands following the end of Japanese rule, as the United States had chosen to launch its own offensive without Spanish involvement. This was not an accidental decision, but instead a politically driven move. Without the Spanish-American War, the United States had always wished for more territory near Asia to expand its military and economic reach. The Caroline Islands, with its native inhabitants evacuated to the Marianas and currently defended by a Japanese presence too sizable to be defeated by Spain, represented the ideal Pacific territory for the United States. After the islands were liberated, the United States reached out through existing back channels to Colonel Casado, offering to purchase the islands from Spain for $15 million. Casado, already exhausted from four years of leading Free Spain, viewed the loss of the Caroline Islands to the United States as a foreseeable and acceptable price to pay for the crucial American support that had enabled his regime to survive, and agreed to the offer. In late 1943, Colonel Casado announced that Spain had sold the islands to the United States for $15 million stating that the loss of the sparsely populated islands would be compensated with sufficient funds to rebuild the war-ravaged Mariana Islands. The reaction was muted in Puerto Rico, where interest in the far-off islands was limited to the exploits of its defenders. On the Pacific Islands themselves, however, the Spanish Republic faced the first real challenge to its rule when thousands of Caroline Islanders began to protest across the Marianas, protests which had to be put down by force. While violence was kept to a minimum, unlike those during the time of Franco's brief rule of the islands, the Caroline Purchase remained a black mark in the history of the Spanish Pacific, the Caroline people themselves, and the Spanish Republic. Although, in retrospect, many argued that had Casada refused, the United States would simply have annexed the Carolines anyway. Soon enough, 1944 had arrived, a crucial year for the Allies of World War II. For Free Spain, 1944 was defined by the liberation of the Philippines. Captain Ramon Magsaysay, who'd led the Filipino rebels to safety in the Marianas and then fought bravely in defense of the islands, had emerged as a hero of the Pacific War. The United States made plans for him to be installed as a future leader of the Philippines after Aguinaldo's pro-Japanese regime was defeated. This dream came to fruition in the spring of 1944. Using the free Spanish Marianas and American Carolines as a staging ground, the liberation of the Philippines began as American, Spanish, Cuban, Filipino, and Mexican troops launched an offensive against the Japanese in the Philippines. Japanese casualty rates neared 100% during the countless battles across the Philippines, while Aguinaldo, increasingly concerned about the fate of his regime, became increasingly withdrawn from his duties as ruler. Things came to a head on October 20th, 1944, which was the day the Philippine capital of Manila fell to Allied forces. In the chaos, Aguinaldo was able to flee via plane to the Japanese home islands, where the war would continue into the next year. After the flight of Aguinaldo, the collapse of his military, and the defeat of the occupying Japanese forces, the Philippines fell under Allied occupation. 
The Allied powers began restoring order across the Philippines, and the first step was the installation of Ramon Magsaysay as the interim president of the Philippines. Under Magsaysay's watchful eye and brilliant guidance, the Philippines would soon enough transition into a true democratic republic and go on to flourish in the post-war era. In 1948, the Philippines would hold its first free and fair elections, which would see Ramon Magsaysay transition from an interim leader to a democratically elected one. Magsaysay would go on to be re-elected numerous times following his victory in 1948, finally leaving office in 1960 whilst leaving a legacy of prosperity and democracy in the Philippines. For Free Spain, the end of the liberation of the Philippines marked the virtual end of their involvement in World War II. 1945 would see the Axis powers collapse amidst the fall of Berlin and the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Japan would surrender to the United States soon after, leaving the Pacific under American hegemony. Emilio Aguinaldo would be extradited to the Philippines from Japan in 1946, where he would be sentenced to house arrest until his death in 1970. After the end of the war, Colonel Casado would begin the process of reverting the Republic's economy back to that of a peacetime economy, amidst the beginning of reconstruction and recovery efforts across the Marianas, which would continue throughout the latter half of the 1940s, driven by diligent workers from the Philippines and Mexico. As the world reoriented amidst the fissures of the Cold War, however, the Spanish Republic would be caught in the middle. Originally dominated by communists, the Republic had scared off most of the Western powers during the Civil War era. However, this changed following the Casadista coup and evacuation to Puerto Rico, which saw Casado's regime break ties with the communists and anarchists and reorient itself to align with liberal democracies and assert the Republican faction's dominance of the Republic's government. This served the regime well during the war against fascism, but their communist past had now come back to haunt them. Following the end of the war, Segismundo Casado's Spanish Republic had earned enough international goodwill to obtain Spain's seat in the newly created United Nations in 1945 in what many considered a major snub to Francisco Franco's Spanish state. However, to complicate matters further, the international community, including the United States, rejected Casado's requests for an intervention to overthrow Franco's regime in Spain and restore his government to power. The major world powers opposed this for various reasons. The Soviets approved of Casado's left-wing government, but despised him personally for his perceived betrayal at the end of the Spanish Civil War. They feared that his government taking power in Spain would result in greater cooperation throughout the capitalist bloc, and thus wished to keep Franco in power as a divisive force in Western Europe. Similarly, whilst the Republic played an important role in World War II, the Western powers feared that toppling Franco during the tense climate of the early Cold War could cause Spain to become a communist state. While Casado's Republic was no longer communist, there were serious doubts as to whether or not he could maintain order in Spain, or if his rule would be weakened by emboldened anarchists and communists seeking to infiltrate the Republic's government anew. This simply was not a risk the capitalist or communist blocs were willing to take, leaving the Spanish Republic in limbo. The situation only worsened, as Franco, sensing the delicate political situation faced by the Spanish Republic, undertook reforms in the early 1950s to make Spain more palatable to the West, including dropping much of his government's more outwardly totalitarian trappings, and reaffirming that Spain was a kingdom, yet retaining the position of head of state for himself. Franco's charm offensive is slowly able to make various nations around the world stop recognizing Casado's regime and start recognizing his instead. This culminates in the passing of UN Resolution No. 107 in 1955, regarding the restoration of the lawful rights of the Spanish state in the United Nations. Proposed by the United Kingdom and resulting in 84, 31 against, and 17 abstaining, this UN vote resulted in the Spanish Republic losing its United Nations seat to the Spanish state in what soon becomes a national embarrassment for the Republic. The Spanish Republic's representatives storm out in protest as the vote's outcome is displayed. Colonel Casado releases a press statement denouncing the fact that fascism is now more welcome in the United Nations than democracy is, and vows that the Spanish Republic, whose existence and authority are not dependent on the recognition of any party except for its citizens, will persevere and continue its experiment in democracy and its efforts to retake and reunify Spain under a country of the people, by the people, and for the people. The loss of the Republic's UN seat to Franco's regime is only compounded by the loss of both American and Soviet diplomatic recognition in 1960, which is also the year Franco's Spanish state becomes a member of NATO. Increasingly isolated across both the First and Second Worlds, the Spanish Republic withdraws itself from international affairs, 
consolidating its focus on maintaining its relations with Latin America and the nations of the Pacific, which it manages to do with success for the most part. The 1960s is spent further developing the Mariana Islands in Puerto Rico and integrating the Republic deeper into the economic network of Latin America. Its main trading partners are Mexico and Cuba, who help free Spain to continue to progress economically as a nation despite their widespread loss of diplomatic recognition. The Republic also manages to maintain informal ties with the United States, carving out a niche for itself as an exporter of medical equipment and pharmaceuticals to the United States. Likewise, the 1960s sees the reorganization of the province of the Spanish Pacific into the province of the Marianas, concurrent with an announcement by longtime Governor Guerrero that he will be retiring in 1964. Following that year's gubernatorial election, Guerrero leaves office as the Marianas province welcomes their second governor under Republican rule, Carlos Camacho. Camacho embarks on an ambitious program of reform that refocuses the island's economy from one relying on imports from Mexico and the Philippines and economic aid from San Juan to one focused on tourism, seeking to create, in his words, a Hawaii for the Spanish-speaking world. In partnership with the Philippines and Mexico, Camacho's push for the creation of a tourist industry in the Marianas is successful and results in his popularity on the island skyrocketing, ensuring continual re-election for years to come. Furthermore, this lessens the Mariana Islands' dependence on the central government in San Juan, and a burgeoning movement for independence from the Spanish Republic emerges in the islands during Camacho's rule. In a completely different outcome, the Caroline Islands, never having been resettled by a civilian population since their evacuation in 1941, have been reduced to nothing more than one large American military base, as well as a common site for conducting nuclear tests in the Pacific Ocean. Similar to the Marianas, Puerto Rico also lost a longtime governor in the 1960s. Governor Pedro Albizu Campos, having led Puerto Rico since the end of colonial rule in 1939, dies in office in 1965. Governor Albizu Campos is replaced by his lieutenant governor, Luis Munoz Marin, a fellow native Puerto Rican who is extremely pro-Spanish and fosters an even closer relationship between Puerto Rico's provincial and national governments. Aside from emerging as an exporter of medical equipment, under Munoz Marin's rule, the provincial government also invests in increasing its soft power through subsidies to support the native arts and culture of Puerto Rico. Governor Munoz Marin successfully convinces the aging Colonel Casado that amidst the loss of diplomatic relations with many nations, soft power will help to keep the nation relevant until the mainland is retaken, a prospect that many begin to doubt will ever happen. Throughout Latin America, Puerto Rican culture is popularized, from local industries like champagne cola to Puerto Rico's famous hibado music, which experiences a renaissance due to subsidies from the national government. Beginning in the 1960s, the nation's most important secular holiday, El Día de la República, or the Day of the Republic, expands beyond just military parades. Under Governor Munoz Marin, celebrations also incorporate more festivities, including performances by the famous hibado musician Ramito every April 14th. Indeed, the 1960s saw the beginning of cultural and political shifts throughout both provinces of Free Spain. However, one unchanging presence throughout all of this was the colonel himself. Now in his 70s, Casado still retained his complete mental faculties and resisted calls for him to step down, maintaining that he had successfully led the republic for nearly three decades and was not about to stop leading the nation now. Colonel Casado remained a very popular figure in both Free Spain and Latin America as a whole, with frequent spontaneous demonstrations breaking out across Puerto Rico in support of the nation's aging leader. A frequent slogan of the era was, Ahora más que nunca, Casado, 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 or, now more than ever, Casado, Casado, Casado. At the same time, Colonel Casado remained pragmatic and began to accept the fact that Spain may never be reunified under his terms or even in his lifetime. Yet he remained committed to ensuring that the two free provinces of Spain would never fall under fascist rule. With Franco's health failing, Casado remained determined to outlast his old rival. The 1970s would be the last decade with a divided Spain. Free Spain rang in the 70s with a cautious hope for the future, as the economies of the Marianas and Puerto Rico had both grown comfortably over the past decade. Colonel Casado, now almost 80 years old, was determined to show the world that the Republic of Spain was still powerful. In this pursuit, he planned a massive extravaganza to celebrate the Republic's 40th anniversary on April 14, 1971. 1971's Día de la República celebration was the largest celebration ever of its kind. Under Casado's orders, military drills and parades were held in Saipan, 
Puerto Rico, tenían en Guajan. Musical performances of both indigenous and Spanish musicians were held across the nation as a martial parade was held in the main streets of San Juan and Agaña. Observers noted that Casado, appearing with Puerto Rican Governor Munoz Marin and Mariana's Governor Camacho at the San Juan Parade, appeared to be in good health, and the 1971 parade reignited discussions of Spanish reunification in various international discourses, including subdued discussions in mainland Spain. Casado's wish to outlive Franco would be granted. Throughout 1975, Franco's health began to fail him, and on November 20th, 1975, Francisco Franco, dictator of mainland Spain, passed away aged 82. Franco's handpicked successor as head of state was the Prince of Spain, Juan Carlos I. Franco had picked Juan Carlos in hopes that the young man would continue his authoritarian regime for decades to come, and many external observers, including the Casavistas in San Juan, believed that Juan Carlos would merely be a continuation of Franco's rule. However, in a shock to the people of both Spains, as King Juan Carlos took power after Franco's death and was crowned King of Spain, he began to introduce reforms to transform Spain's form of governance from an authoritarian dictatorship to a constitutional monarchy. His motivations were multifaceted. King Juan Carlos wished to democratize Spain to continue its economic growth, as well as hopefully begin reunification talks with the ardently pro-democracy republic in exile in Puerto Rico. Segismundo Casado weighed his options carefully. While the republic had originally been created in response to the unpopular rule of King Alfonso, he saw that not only was the new king partial to democratic rule, but he embraced it. Although it would mean the dissolution of his authority, if the free provinces would remain democratic as well as the mainland, he saw no reason to continue the now needless division of the two Spains. To the surprise of many, in January of 1977, after the initial reforms by the king had been implemented and elections had been called, Colonel Casado, along with several members of his cabinet and a security detail, made the journey from San Juan to Madrid, setting foot on the mainland again for the first time in decades. Colonel Casado had arrived as a guest of the king, and was invited to a closed-door meeting with Spain's monarch. Colonel Casado soon took a liking to the young sovereign, and reunification discussions were amicable. The king made several assurances to Casado during their meetings. 1. Colonel Segismundo Casado would be recognized officially as a former Spanish head of state, and would be allowed to relocate to Spain with his family at his earliest convenience. He would also be buried in Spain with full military honors if he so wished. 2. The military of the Republic of Spain would be integrated into the Royal Spanish Army, with every enlisted man retaining his current rank or the Royal Army's equivalent rank. 3. The current provincial government in Puerto Rico would retain its current powers and personnel, and Governor Munoz Marin would remain in power at least until the next election. 4. King Juan Carlos I would remain committed to democratic rule, and fascism would never again rule over Spain. 5. The Kingdom of Spain would honor Casado's previous agreement with the Mariana Islanders. With the end of inter-Spanish hostilities, the people of the Mariana Islands would be free to decide their own destiny with an independence referendum. Following these assurances by the king, negotiations came to an end, as Colonel Casado returned to Puerto Rico in order to seek the permission of the National Defense Council and the Republic's unicameral Cortes. After delivering news of the king's assurances, both the National Defense Council and Legislative Cortes approved two documents, a reunification agreement with the Kingdom of Spain and a bill allowing for an independence referendum in the Marianas, which was simultaneously approved in the mainland's Cortes Generales in March of 1977. Soon after, preparations for reunification began, as the National Defense Council disbanded and Colonel Casado resigned from his position as head of state. On April 14, 1977, after nearly 40 years of separation, the Spanish Republic and the Kingdom of Spain reunified. The occasion was commemorated with celebrations in both Puerto Rico and mainland Spain, with the one in mainland Spain featuring King Juan Carlos and the elderly Colonel Casado in a motorcade together. On May 1, 1977, a free and fair independence referendum, presided over by Governor Camacho, was held in the Marianas province. With an overwhelming 85% vote for independence, the province of the Marianas voted to become a sovereign nation independent of Spain, effective immediately. Spain honored the wishes of the Marianas, and by late June 1977, the last Spanish military forces departed the capital city of Agaña, newly renamed to Hagatnia. Upon independence, Governor Carlos Camacho became President Camacho and oversaw a new era for the Marianas as an independent nation built on tourism and aquaculture. The Republic of the Marianas would retain close ties to Spain forever, as well as with Latin America and the Republic of the Philippines. 
enjoying its status as the Hawaii of the Spanish-speaking world. As the era of a divided Spain came to a close, Colonel Casado's democratic government in exile would retroactively be termed El Casadiato by historians. With Spain unified under democratic rule, Colonel Casado finally retired to enjoy his last years back home in mainland Spain, enjoying a life of leisure with his family in a villa in the capital city, purchased with his generous government pension. Colonel Casado was often known to take walks around the bustling capital, taking in the sights and seeing just how much his beloved homeland had changed since he'd left so many years before. In October of 1980, Colonel Casado embarked on his last visit to Puerto Rico at the invitation of Governor Munoz Marin to celebrate his 87th birthday, along with a large crowd in San Juan, before returning to mainland Spain soon after due to ill health. Roughly one year later, on December 25, 1981, Colonel Segismundo Casado, Caudillo de la República, passed away at his home in Madrid, aged 88. Casado was honored with a state funeral as Puerto Rico declared three days of mourning for the fallen leader. King Juan Carlos, Governor Munoz Marin, and President Camacho were all in attendance at the funeral, where Casado's casket was lowered into the earth, draped in the tricolor flag of the Spanish Republic. And so came to an end a crucial chapter in the modern history of Spain, which all started with the success of José Martí's Cuban rebellion almost a century prior. Spain was reunified under a democratic regime. The Caroline Islands had been lost to the United States. The Philippines, after decades of dictatorship, had found peace and prosperity after Ramon Magsaysay's democratic revolution, and the Republic of Cuba had successfully followed the path laid out for them by the nation's founding father, José Martí, and had emerged as a democratic power in the Caribbean. As for Puerto Rico, it had been a long and tumultuous journey, with both good and bad. After the horrors of the Primo de Rivera and Franco regimes on the island, Puerto Rico had been rejuvenated under Republican rule, and emerged as an economically prosperous island developed to its full potential under Colonel Casado and Pedro Albizu Campos. Furthermore, Governor Luis Munoz Marin helped to spread Puerto Rican culture far and wide. Ibarro music had been the first Puerto Rican music craze to sweep Latin America, but not the last. In the 1980s, a family of Spanish exiles in Puerto Rico had formed the world's most popular rumba band, known as the Gypsy Kings, who remained a strong presence in Puerto Rican music for decades to come. And finally, in the 2010s came Puerto Rico's biggest contribution to the music world yet, reggaeton. The reggaeton craze culminated in Eurovision 2017, when the Kingdom of Spain emerged as the undisputed victor of the song contest, with its entry Despacito by Luis Fonsi easily beating all of their songs and going on to be a worldwide hit. And just as Puerto Rico's culture was a strong cultural touchstone for Spain, Spain remained committed to Puerto Rico and its people. In September 2017, Hurricane Maria devastated the island of Puerto Rico and killed thousands. Thankfully, though, the Kingdom of Spain was quick to respond and devoted billions of euros to the recovery efforts on the island, bringing both the mainland and Puerto Rico closer together in the aftermath. And so ends the story of a world where the Spanish-American War never happened. <laughs>